Welcome back to our Sunday night study of Christian doctrine. We are currently looking at the biblical doctrine of God, and tonight we're going to consider what is the main attribute of God, and that is God's holiness. Now, even though holiness truly defines who God is, holiness is one of the most difficult concepts for us to understand. In the Bible, holiness is the one word that is used over and over again to describe the essential nature of God, who He is, the perfection of His nature, holiness. A.W. Tozer writes in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, Holy is the way God is. To be holy, He does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Because He is holy, all of His attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. Now the reason that we cannot fully comprehend and appreciate the holiness of God is because God's holiness is what sets Him apart from us, from mankind. In another book written by Eric Alexander, called Our Great God and Savior, he says that the thing that makes it most difficult for us to conceptualize the holiness of God is that holiness relates to His distinctiveness. It is what makes God different from us, and it is because we are so remote from Him in His holiness that we find it difficult to conceptualize this attribute. In fact, the word holiness in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, as well as in the Greek of the New Testament, centers on the concept of something being set apart. When used of God, holiness describes God's utter set-apartness from His creation, again, including mankind. Gerhardus Voss, in his book Reformed Dogmatics, describes God's utter set-apartness as a metaphysical gap in which God exists in Himself and nothing can be compared to Him. Even the divinely inspired writers of Scripture could not find the words to describe the holiness of God and its attending glory, which really is the outshining of all that God is. For example, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, when the prophet describes the vision of God sitting on the throne high and lifted up, all that he is able to say when describing this glory of God, this manifestation of God's holiness, is that the train of his robe filled the temple. That's the best that he could do. In Exodus 24.10, when the elders of Israel are called up to the mountain to see God, the best way that they could describe the glory of God that was before their eyes was to say that there was under his feet as it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. They couldn't even raise their gaze up. They could merely look in humility and at the feet of God, as it were. One more example in the book of uh, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, he has the same problem, trying to give an accurate description of God. And the best that he can do was to describe the holiness of God, the holiness of God as being in the likeness of, and then he describes something, or, quote, he had the appearance of, and then makes this comparison, or finally saying, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. Now remember, the biblical writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote, but there just are no words in the human language then and now that can fully describe the holiness of God. It would be like um, looking into the sun with the naked eye and then trying to describe the fullness of, of, of that sun. It's impossible. But perhaps in all the Bible, when coming to understand the holiness of God and its attending glory, that outshining of who God is, there is no better book than the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Especially in chapters in chapter six, verses one through seven. So what I would like to do is just kind of look at those seven verses to give us a biblical comprehension of the holiness of God 
and our place uh, before his holy presence. These seven verses can be divided into three parts. The vision of God's holiness would be verses 1 through 4. Then in verse 5, we have the prophet's response to God's holiness. And then in verses 6 and 7, our last two verses, point 3, God's cure for the prophet's unholiness. And uh, the best way to remember this three-point breakdown of these seven verses in Isaiah chapter 6 is to say the vision, the response, and the cure. So let's look at the vision of God given to Isaiah by God in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The prophet begins in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is what we looked at a while ago. The best that Isaiah could do was to describe the manifested holiness of God is as a train of a robe that is filling the temple. It's the best he could do even inspired by God. That's the best language that he had. And the first thing, then, that we want to take note of in verse 1 is the timing of this vision. Isaiah dates the vision to the year that King Uzziah died. So the question that we want to ask, ask next is, who is King Uzziah? And now, just for sake of uh, interpretation, in 2 Kings 51, King Uzziah is called Azariah. We're going to use King Uzziah. King Uzziah was one of the good kings that ruled the southern kingdom of Judah during the period of, of Israelite history called the Divided Kingdom. Because there was a rift between uh, the people of Israel when uh, Solomon's son took over, that the ten tribes of Israel comprised the northern kingdom, whereas Judah and Benjamin comprised the southern kingdom. So King Uzziah was one of the good kings that ruled the southern kingdom of Judah. Not all of Israel's kings in the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom were good. But here was King Uzziah, who did, according to Second Chronicles 26.4, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In chapter 26, verse 3 of Second Chronicles, we read that Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. One book writes um, a bit of a commentary on Uzziah's reign. The author says that there had seldom been a king who sought the well-being of his people and did good for them as Uzziah did. He was probably the greatest king since the days of Solomon. Unfortunately, however, the reign of King Uzziah did not end well. We read in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And as a result of his pride, the Lord struck Uzziah with leprosy. And according to Second Chronicles chapter 20, 26, verse 21, King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. All right, so what's the significance of the vision of God given to the prophet Isaiah coinciding with the death of King Uzziah. Well, after the 52-year successful reign of King Uzziah, the people had come to depend on their earthly king. And so his death had left them uncertain about the future. And so God at this time gives his prophet Isaiah a vision of himself, the Lord God, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, to assure the people of God that their God was still in control and that they should put their confidence in Him, not in an earthly king, no matter how good that king might have been. While good rulers are certainly a blessing and sorely lacking today, we should always be thankful for the good leaders that God sends our way. But as God's own people, we must never put all of our hope and trust in mortal kings, but in a holy God whose rule is eternal and whose glory fills heaven. As Isaiah described, the train of his robe filled the temple. Again, the prophet's not able to fully describe the glory of God that filled the temple, 
but nonetheless he gives us a visual image of the majesty and wonder of God's holiness. Now, in the next three verses, the prophet Isaiah describes how the angels in heaven respond to the manifested display of God's holiness, which is the glory of God. Beginning with verse 2. Uh, above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. How did these angels, these seraphim, respond to this, to this display of God's holiness? Isaiah tells us that they covered themselves with their wings in the presence of the holy and glory of God. Holiness and glory of God. This is the response of humility. Isaiah said that with two wings the angels covered their face, which would indicate the covering up of the upper half of the body. And then he says that the angels covered with two wings their feet, which indicates covering the lower half of the angel's body. In essence, covering the entire body of the angels as they are in the presence of God. And so what we see here is that not even the sinless angels of heaven can behold the fullness of God's holy presence displayed before them. And their actions indicate humility before the presence of God. But it is by their spoken words, what they say next, that the angels <clears throat> indicate their response to the holy presence of God. Verses 3 and 4, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. <clears throat> Excuse me. Holy, holy, holy. The cry of the angels in their declaration of the holiness of God is a cry that is so thunderous that Isaiah tells us that it shook the very foundations of the threshold of the temple of heaven. Now, of this three-time declaration of the holiness of God, Alexander again writes in his book, the Hebrew language has no word for very. So, so why did the angel say, holy, holy, holy? Well, in the Hebrew language, there's no word for very. Indeed, it has no forms corresponding to our English superlatives, such as the greatest, the best, the deepest, and so on. So, Hebrew repeats the word. Thus we find the Lord Jesus saying in the Aramaic language, which is related to Hebrew, Truly, truly, I say unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. It is a way of emphasizing that what he is saying is especially true and important. And so the repetition is a linguistic device to stress the importance of what is being said. So the angels, by shouting, holy three times, are emphasizing the one thing about God that is so important, the one thing that is of the utmost significance, the one thing that truly is the manifestation of God, and that is His holiness. But their thrice holy cries are not just theological declarations about the nature of God, although they are, they are actually the cries of beings who are worshiping God in His holiness. So, both by their actions of covering themselves with their wings in humility, and by their words, these angelic beings are worshiping God. They are glorying in the glory of God's holiness. So, to glory in the glory of God is what true worship is. What makes heaven so heavenly? It's not just living forever, although that is pretty important. It's not just seeing loved ones who have died in the Lord, although that's something that is true and we look forward to it. What makes heaven so heavenly is the presence of God, in which his people, like the angels, will glory in God's glory forever. 
Psalm 116 verse 11 tells us, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, God created us for fellowship with Him, to glory in His glory. And by so doing, we are experiencing in our beings the fullness of joy. Worship is bringing joy to us because we are glorying in the glory of God. Now we get a taste of that today, but think of heaven, what that will be like. With no sin, no distractions, no frustrations, uh, no death, dying, war, no COVID-19, no wearing of masks. To be in the presence of God and to glory in His glory, which brings us the fullness of joy. Well, for those in Christ, that certainly is what we are hopeful about and long to be uh, experiencing. But the fact of the matter is, for all people, apart from Christ now, just think of the world as it is without Christ, sin has separated us from the very one who is the source of our joy. And so without Christ, there's no real joy in our lives. We, we're miserable. And in our misery, we, we are vainly pursuing different things that can never really truly satisfy us. These things that we seek to replace what is missing in us because of the absence of God are idols. These are God-replacing idols. They promise happiness. They promise contentment. They promise a sense of well-being. But they only lead to the destruction of our souls. So what are we are so what are we to do? We are most sinful and God is most holy. And never the twain shall meet. In Isaiah five, the prophet records his response to being in the presence of the holiness of God, and his response is the response of us all, because the Bible tells us in Romans three twenty three that we have all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So point number one in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, point number one is the vision of the holiness of God. And now we come to point number two, which is the prophet's response to this vision of the holiness of God. And look at verse 5 with me. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The prophet's cry is a cry of woe. Woe is me, for I am lost. This is the cry of utter despair upon the realization that Isaiah is a sinful man, and he cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. And then to compound his misery and his utter despair... In the realization that his sin has made him unable to stand before God, he realizes that there is nothing that he can do to change that. He is a man, he says, of unclean lips, and he's not the only one. Isaiah goes on to say, And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The Apostle Peter, before he was an apostle, the Lord Jesus was teaching and he told Peter to go out and uh, throw his net on this side of the boat and they'd catch a bunch of fish and, and they'd fished all night and caught nothing. And upon this miracle, Peter realized that Jesus was not just a man, that he was actually standing in the presence of God. And this is Peter's response to the presence of God in his life in Luke chapter 5 verse 8. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. This truly is the despair of all who come to realize, like Isaiah and like Peter, that they are utterly undone before the holy presence of God because of their sins. It wasn't until they were in the presence of God it wasn't until then that they realized 
how sinful they were. It's like Victor Hugo's Hunchback of Notre Dame. Quasimodo, who's the hunchback, very disfigured in face and in form, he takes the beautiful Esmeralda to the top of one of the towers of Notre Dame. And when he looks at her face, he says, I never realized how ugly I was until I saw your beauty. It's like that with God. It is seeing God in all of his holiness that produces this conviction of sin that causes us to cry out, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And so, as Isaiah beholds the glory of God, he's undone. He's utterly undone because of sin. Because of his sin, he cannot stand in the presence of God. And there's nothing that he can do to change that situation. That is about as hopeless as it gets. So he cries out, Woe, woe is me. But soon the despair of the prophet gives way to a great hope and joy. For while Isaiah is unable to cure himself, the Lord is more than able to provide a cure for Isaiah's sin, so that Isaiah can stand in the presence of God. And that takes us to a third and final point, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, the cure. So after Isaiah's cry of despair, in verse 5, verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me, having his hand in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Notice, first of all, that God's cure for Isaiah's sin comes from the altar. Now this brings up Old Testament imagery, and rightly so, for the altar in the temple was the place where sins were atoned for by the sacrifice of an animal in the place of a person. A life for a life, an innocent life in the place of the guilty life. And when the animal was to be sacrificed, what the priest would do is that he would lay his hands on the head of the animal and confess their sins. This symbolized the transfer of guilt from the person, the sinful person, to the innocent animal. And then the priest would sacrifice the animal on the altar. Thus, the shedding of the blood of the sacrificial animal provided atonement for the sinful person. Now, every sacrificial animal in the Old Testament was but a shadow of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, God incarnate, God in human flesh, to die an atoning death in the place of sinners, in order to redeem us unto a holy God. On the cross, God placed our sins on His sinless Son. He attributed our sins to His sinless Son, which was symbolized in the Old Testament by the priest putting his hands on the sacrificial animal and confessing the sins of the people before he sacrificed the animal in an atoning sacrifice for their sins. On the cross, God placed our sins, he attributed our sins to his sinless son, who then was cru uh, crucified, sacrificed in our place before the very wrath of God in our sins. So, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus, the sinless, giving himself for the sinful to atone for our sins so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to God. Notice also that it is God who must apply the cure because we cannot save ourselves. The angel took burning coal from the altar of sacrifice, the altar of atonement, and he touched the prophet's mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Only when God takes that burning coal of the shed blood of his son Jesus Christ and applies it to our sinful and wicked hearts are we then made right and holy before a holy God made acceptable in the presence of God for in Christ alone by faith alone are sinful people 
able to come into the holy presence of God. In Christ, believers are not only declared holy before God, but we are also made holy, which is the process of sanctification. Two things taking place here when it comes to the atonement and being made holy and being made righteous, being made right before God. Again, it's being declared right, our position before God in Christ, and practically speaking, our actual holiness on this earth as redeemed human beings. So, a believer's position before God, a believer's position before God in Christ, is one of holiness. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, our righteousness before God is the righteousness of Christ. Look at it like this. Uh, when God looks at our account, he should see sin, because that's what we are, sinful. But because of the atonement, the blood of Jesus covers our sin, and what God sees in that account, then, is the sinless righteousness of his own Son attributed to us. Now, those that that God have, those whom God has declared righteous, positionally speaking, right now, when you believe in Christ, you are declared righteous in the presence of God. God actually makes us holy in our heart and in our conduct, from the inside out, if you will. Listen to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, that is, before you were saved. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, and then Peter quotes Leviticus 11:44, you shall be holy for I am holy. This is the aspect of our holiness that is called sanctification, which is progressive in that it is ongoing throughout the life of the Christian. And sanctification in the life of a believer occurs when the Holy Spirit makes us progressively holy from the inside out as we strive to obey the Lord in all things. Peter, again, makes that clear. Listen to his wording again in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 16. As obedient children, that is, children who are obeying the Word of God, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, that is, before you were saved life, but be holy. God's holy, and He calls us to be holy. So we are in Christ, declared holy, and made holy. And that is a wonderful truth. Because our sin disqualifies us from having any hope at all of being reconciled to God. There's not any holiness in us, and there's no place we can get our own holiness. We need someone else's. And so, apart from Christ, then, there's nothing that we can do to redeem ourselves unto God. But people don't really consider you know, a lifetime of sin as being something that merits God's wrath for us in hell. Uh, that betrays a, a failure to understand the holiness of God and the tragedy of sin. Look at it this way. As you consider the seriousness of sin, for one sin, for one sin, Adam and Eve were cast out of paradise. For one sin, Moses was forbidden to enter the promised land for one sin. Now, how many sins have we committed? How many sins have I committed in my lifetime? And how many sins will I commit even in my walk with Christ because of flesh? And so why should any of us think that we would be the exception to this? For one sin, Adam was kicked out of the garden. For one sin, Moses was disqualified from entering the promised land after bringing the people of God out of Egyptian bondage. When we are confronted with our own sin and the holiness of God, the best that we can do is to despair and cry out with Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he realized this because he said, My eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. But while we are totally then unable to redeem ourselves, 
God has done something to redeem us unto himself. For in sending his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, God has saved us from himself for himself. God has saved us from himself in that he has saved us from his wrath, and he has saved us for himself to be his dear children forever. Only in Christ can we go from crying out in despair, woe is me, to the adulation and joy of Abba, Father. That is why we love God and seek to obey God in all things, because God loves us that much. Listen to Romans 5, 8, and we're almost done. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is why we love God, because he first loved us. I pray uh, that you know Christ savingly and that you are experiencing his love on a daily basis and are growing in sanctification, growing in holiness, as you seek to obey the Lord in all things in life. But if you did not know Christ savingly, and like Isaiah, you're in great despair about the helplessness, the hopelessness of your situation, know that there is hope, a sure hope. For the Word of God assures you that if you turn from your sins to faith in Jesus Christ and follow Him, you will indeed be saved. You will be reconciled to God. You will be made fit in Christ to come into the presence of God as his dear child. Christ will not turn you away. Only believe. All right, we're going to stop there for tonight. And as I said at the beginning, um, I'm not the only one that said this. Is This is a... a uh, common understanding of God's holiness that it's incomprehensible you you just can't we as human beings beings creations of God can't wrap our minds around the fullness of God's holiness but the Holy Spirit brings enough of a realization of God's holiness into our minds and hearts to convict us of our sin before his holy presence and nobody ever comes to Christ unwilling they want to be redeemed because Christ has shown them their sin and has given them the cure. And rather than me trying to pick out all the verses in the Bible, and there are many that talk about the holiness of God, I think Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1-7 through 7 helps us better understand the holiness of God, even within our own human uh, limitations remembering that the Holy Spirit certainly opens our minds and hearts for truth and draws us to Christ and makes us fit to stand before God by the giving of himself and atoning sacrifice for our sins. I pray that you know the Lord, and if you don't, know that you can by coming to him. Faith alone in Christ alone. All right, next Sunday night, uh, we will continue the study of the attributes of God looking at other attributes of God. But until then, good night, and God bless, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, as always, for our time together in your word. And Lord, our prayer is that your Holy Spirit would open our minds and hearts for truth, so that we might comprehend the things that are ours in Christ, so that we might believe and follow you all the days of our life, and then to enter into your presence, Lord, to have joy forevermore as we glory in your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Until next time.